Please read section 10.8 and 9. Do examples 15 and 16. Okay, now, if I were to take a rotating object and uh, apply a torque to it, obviously I'm doing work. I mean, I'm taking energy from some other system and I'm transferring it in there, like my arm. If, I, if, I, if I'm going to spin the, uh, a wheel, i got to grab it, I, I pull on it, I, it makes it spin. And it's got, you know, and now there's there's kinetic energy in there. So I had to transfer energy from, you know, my my arm and transfer it into the rotating object by applying a torque to it. So we want to talk about uh, doing work. I mean, what is the work? You know, what, it, what uh, we're going to talk about work, energy, and power when it comes to rotating objects, rotating systems. OK, well, first let's, uh, let's use analogous variables that we have. Um, well, we have the work energy theorem that says the work done by a net force is equal to the change in kinetic energy uh, of an object. Well. It turns out we're going to have the same thing, the work done by a, a net torque. I can just read, the, I don't even need to change anything here. The work done by a net torque is going to be equal to the change in kinetic energy. Now, remember when we had work, so there's my net force. I had a displacement, right? And that was work. And this was one half m v final squared minus one half m v initial squared. Well, think about what we're doing now. Think about analogous variables that we've been talking about. Um, now this is not a derivation, okay? This is just, hey, look, this will work. And then we'll actually go through it rigorously. But what's going to be cool here is just by using analogous variables, I can get what I want. Well, what's the rotational equivalent of force? Torque. Now what's the rotational equivalent of a, uh, a, a, a displacement? Yeah, a, ch a little tiny, this is a little tiny change in position. Here's a little tiny change in angle. And this is going to be equal to 1 half m, oh, not m, oops. Yeah, what's the rotational equivalent of mass? I. I, rotational inertia. And this is omega final squared minus one half i omega initial squared. So this is the work energy theorem for rotational motion. If I apply a torque through an angle, I've done work. And uh, the result of doing that work, if that torque was the net torque on the object, is to change the rotational kinetic energy of that object. Okay. Now. Let's, um, this is not a, a proof, let's take a look at um, a particle. And I always like, when I'm dealing with, with torque and all that, I always like to start with a particle, like a, like a little mass tied to a string. Uh, because I think that, that connects it to what we've already done, but now it's rotating. Um, and so what we have here is, uh, imagine an object that's moving in a circle, and it's got some mass like this, and here's the radius, r. 
Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a force to this, a tangential force. This is F sub T. I'm trying to draw this in with some perspective here. So this is, a, this is tangential to the path. And so it's going to change the speed of the object, right? And because it's going to change the speed of the object, it's going to change the object's kinetic energy. OK, so I can say that the work done as this thing goes around in a circle is um, the tangential force times uh, you know delta r uh, no no it's not delta r I'm sorry because it's gonna be going around an arc length it's gonna be delta s and s is our arc length Okay, so if I multiply these two, okay, um, and let's say this tangential force is also the net force, okay, that's going to be equal to one half m v final squared minus one half m v initial squared. How am I doing on that? Yeah, okay. All right, well, um, so this is good. Now, what I'm going to do now uh, is uh, I'm going to relate these to the angular velocity. So remember that V is equal to R omega, right? Um, and so if I want to do that, I can substitute this in here, and which I will do up here. So let me... Let me uh, So what we have here is the tangential force times my arc arc length, okay, is equal to uh, one half m. Now v initial is uh, r omega initial squared, uh, plus one half the mass times r. Let's see, this should be final, sorry. R omega initial quantity squared. So now I'm just get I'm just turning the linear kinetic energy terms into a, uh, angular uh, terms. Okay, so this is going to be equal to one half m uh, r squared omega final squared and Oh, it's supposed to be minus, yeah. And then this is, uh, so minus 1 half uh, m r squared. And there's my rotational inertia times omega initial squared. OK, so and this will give us 1 half i omega final squared minus one half i omega initial squared. And that's what we wanted, right? Now we've got this in terms of rotational um, variables. But now let's let's take a look at this guy right here. Well, let's take a look at delta s. Well, and let's get that in terms of delta theta. So let's go back to my picture here. Let's pick a delta s. So here's my arc length right here. There's my delta s. And here's r, and here's theta. Now, how are these things related? Well, in radians, well, we said that theta, when we're dealing with radians, and we always will be here, theta, or actually, we can think of this as being delta theta, right? Delta theta is equal to delta s over r. Does that make sense? You follow that? All right, that's how a radian is defined, by the way. It's the arc length divided by the radius. Well, so now I can say delta s is equal 
to R delta theta. So now I'm going to take this and substitute it in here for my for delta S. So I get the tangential force times R times my change in angle is the equivalent of the work done by that that net tangential force. Well, let's just rearrange this a little bit. This is R times my tangential force times delta theta. But what is R times tangential force? This is how we define torque. So we've done it. We've said that the torque times the change in angle is equal to 1 half i omega final squared minus 1 half i omega initial squared. Now we did it for a particle, but it's easy to take that particle and extend it to a system of particles that are all, you know, connected together on the same, with the same angular velocity. And then you just take that and ex to an extended body. Um, and, and, and so this really does work. Now, if you let your delta theta shrink to zero, and then you take the integral, you've got the actual official definition here, the integral of the torque times d theta is is equal to 1 half i omega final squared minus 1 half i omega initial squared. Now, we already did this. Oh, sorry. Let me know if I'm off camera because I am recording this. So, um, Here's what, what I mean, we, we already got this just by using analogous variables from before. Okay, so this whole analogous variable thing is a very powerful thing, especially if you're taking an AP test and you can't remember the equation. But you remember the linear equation, but you don't remember the rotational equation. Just say, oh, wait, analogous variables. Just go from that equation to the next one, and it, it works every time. Yes? Oh, yes, it does. Okay. All right, so this is the work energy theorem for um, the uh, for rotational motion. Uh, by the way, the book the book derives it a little bit differently than I do, so feel free to read the book, and um, and you'll get a different treatment of it. But it's the same answer and same idea, so I don't really want to uh, take a lot of time with that. Now. Of course, all the stuff that we've done with, with uh, power and, and, and all, it, it all works the same. I mean, power you know, power is equal to the rate of change of work. And this is a W, not an omega, dW dt or the rate of change of energy or whatever. Well, if I operate the derivative on this, the time derivative, oh, let me zoom back in. If I operate the time derivative on, on this integral here, well, you know, um, It, you know, if the torque was constant and you bring that out, you operate the derivative on, you know, d, what is d theta dt? Well, that's angular velocity. So we can say that the instantaneous power is equal to the torque on the object at that instant times the angular velocity. So this is, uh, the power that a motor is, you know, has to put out 
right? You know, we, we have a situation where you have a motor and it's turning a, a wheel or something, and it's applying a torque to the wheel, and this is the angular velocity of that wheel, and, and it has to be in radians per second or it doesn't work. And then, um, and that, that's the power that the wheel is, is putting out. And remember, we did this with analogous variables. We did this before. We said that power was equal to force dotted with velocity. Now, by the way, why am I leaving the dot products and the vectors off of these? Well, I really should include them, except that in this class, everything's the, the axis is going to be fixed. And we're going to, you know, the torque is with respect to that axis. The angular velocity is with respect to that axis. So there's no need for the dot product. You know, you don't have the axis at an angle from the torque that's weird. You know, every, everything's going to be uh, nice and, and clean. And, and um, so there's no need for it. So I don't include it. OK. Let's now talk about, whoa, rolling motion. Now I'm going to do this on uh, the screen up here because I'm recording this and I'm going to put it up. It's much easier to demonstrate this and I will demonstrate it. And, uh, let's zoom out a little bit. Oh, that's too much. Zoom in. So I want you to think about a wheel that's rolling. And we want to understand it in terms of energy now. Um, so this is going to be rolling motion. And we're going to assume that the object isn't going to change shape or anything. Right? Like it's a wheel. It's pretty rigid. And it's not going to change its shape. In other words, the rotational inertia of this object is constant. Um, well, here's the ground. So imagine a bowling ball rolling down the floor. OK. Now, here's the center of the bowling ball. And it's moving with a certain velocity. Now, when we say that it's rolling, we have, a, we have this very specific meaning for that. Like, what is rolling motion? Rolling motion means that if you look right here microscopically at the point of contact between the ball and the floor, there's no sliding. OK, this bowling ball is not skidding along the floor. It's rolling. Now, think about this in terms of energy. This ball also has an angular velocity. So what kind of kinetic energy does it have? Look, somebody had to do work on this thing, and that work resulted in the bowling ball moving to the right. So the bowling ball has kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared. But this only accounts for the bowling ball's translational motion. What is the bowling ball also doing? It's also, yeah, rotating. It has rotational kinetic energy as well. Now, this is true for all objects, not just rolling objects, but all objects moving in space. Imagine you had a satellite in space, and it was spinning on its axis, and it was moving. It would have this much linear kinetic energy. It would have this much uh, rotational kinetic energy. And you would just add them together to get the total kinetic energy. But if an object is rolling, there is a connection between its linear velocity and its angular velocity. This is what makes rolling motion different. If I knew how fast this wheel is spinning, I could figure out how fast uh, it's, it's translating. 
because way out here on the edge, let's see, it's got a, let's give it a radius of R and a mass of M. I could say this, the velocity of this guy is equal to R omega. That is, the speed of this is, all, is, is equal to the speed of the outside of the bowling ball. Like if the bowling ball was just spinning, right? Let's say you, you held it on a string and you spun it. And then you looked at the velocity, the, the, you know, the, the circumference of, of that. You know, what's, what's going on at the outside of the bowling ball? Oh, you'd say, well, the linear speed of the bowling ball is just r omega. But if you put that bowling ball down and it's spinning like that, and there's no sliding between these surfaces, the bowling ball is going to roll at that speed. So, in other words, this velocity is related, the linear velocity of the bowling ball is related to the angular velocity of the bowling ball if it's rolling. Well, this is a very handy little thing because now I can take this and substitute in there. So we have kinetic energy equals one half m v squared is e, uh, plus one half i. Now this is going to be uh, um, omega or v. I'm sorry, omega is equal to v over r. We have to square it. Now, if this is a bowling ball, we can do one other thing. We can look up the equation for the rotational inertia of the bowling ball. And it turns out that for a solid sphere, I is equal to 2 fifths mr squared. Let me check that. I think that's right. I just looked back on that table that we talked about before. And it's all, yeah, 2 fifths mr squared. So now all I need to do is substitute that in here. Well, I won't. I'll substitute it in here. And something very cool happens with rolling motion. It's, 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 it's really neat. Well, I like it. Well, I becomes 2 fifths mr squared times v squared over r squared. So guess what happens to the r squared? Yeah, it goes away. Whoop. And, and so what I get is that the kinetic energy of the bowling ball is 1 half m v squared. That's the linear kinetic energy plus the rotational kinetic energy is 1 fifth m v squared. In other words, if you have rolling motion and you have some expression for the rotational inertia of your rolling object, which is, by the way, wheels are always round, so it's always going to have an R, whether it's a disk or a solid sphere or a, or a hollow sphere, you're always going to have an R squared in that, in that rotational inertia equation, which is always going to cancel out with this. The only thing that's going to be different is this fraction right here. But anyway, I can add up 1 half plus uh, 1 fifth, uh, get a common denominator of 10. So it's 5 tenths plus 2 tenths is 7 tenths. So the total kinetic energy can be reduced to one term, 7 tenths mv squared. So this means that if you the total kinetic energy of the rolling ball isn't 1 half mv squared anymore, it's 7 tenths mv squared because the object is not only um, translating, it's also rotating. And so you'll have to include uh, this idea in your, uh, you know, in your energy equations. When you're using energy to solve a problem, you will have to include that um, in there. So 
So that's the main idea here, is that rolling objects have kinetic energy split up into two ob uh, into uh, linear and rotational kinetic energy at the same time. If it's rolling, you can almost always combine these two into one term. You have to know what the expression is for the rotational inertia, and you have to recognize that if it's rolling, then the linear velocity of the center of this object is going to be equal to r omega. And you can use that to reduce it down. Okay, that's it.